Kurt um, is one of our friends from Discover Financial. And this guy knows a lot when it comes to monitoring all kinds of infrastructure and uh, applications. He's been doing it for quite some time, has a ton of experience with a lot of different tools. And so he's going to share with us uh, basically how they came to uh, learn about InfluxDB and why they needed uh, a time series database to help them with their um, infrastructure observability. All right, with that, Kurt, I'll let you take it away. Thanks. So I've been uh, doing uh, monitoring for quite some time. Um, um, I started when I was five years old. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I started with uh, IBM 36 actually while I was in uh, high school. Um, I got a little job doing some monitoring for an IBM 36 box and we're actually uh, doing pagers to uh, Skytel pagers and the whole deal. And that's precursor to the AS400. So I've been doing monitoring for a very long time. Uh, a large insurance company that begins with an A for a long time, 27 years, and I've been at Discover for five years, trying to help them with observability. I did start there as a senior manager, and recently in the last eight months, I changed to the domain architect role. So in January 2019, when I first got to Discover, we, were, uh, we had some very, very old tools. Um, and we had brought in CAUIM uh, as our infrastructure mining tool. And just let's say that it didn't, uh, didn't work out the way we expected it to. It was very slow. It had flash in the GUI, uh, just a lot of issues with it. So in, in January of 2019, we made a decision to replace it. And we, we did look at the new UIM, uh, which is basically the old NIMSoft. We looked at uh, single FX, IBM, Datadog, uh, Influx Data. The final two were between Datadog and Influx Data. Um, and uh, we chose Influx Data as our partner and signed the contract in 2019. Now, the reasons for the selection, a lot of it had to do with price, uh, the technology, uh, you know, there was some data dog gaps were the same. Uh, we do some callback, which is some uh, auto healing with UIM and either product can necessarily do that. We have to figure out different ways to do that. And we felt that the agents were similar. We felt that the uh, uh, the Datadog GUI was a little bit uh, more refined uh, and alerting was more refined, but it didn't seem like anything we couldn't work with. And so far, we've been extremely happy with the uh, influx and the speed. So our overall uh, process here at Discover has changed since I got there. And this is something that uh, I put together about our strategy moving forward. And um, we've, we've uh, hit these different buckets quite uh, honestly, over the last five years, AppDynamics came in about four years ago. We have about 700 daily users of that. Um, we uh, we uh, are replacing our old NetCool with uh, MOOCsoft. It's a competitor to uh, Big Panda. It's an uh, AI ops event management tool. Um, we brought in CatchPoint for our synthetics. And as you see below, we've already replaced Ganglia with Influx, and we're in currently in the process of replaying uh, the CA product with uh, Influx as well. And all these things actually feed Moogsoft uh, at this present time. So we are live with Moogsoft, and Influx still is the only one that's not completely live. We're looking to start alerting out of Influx in the next 30 days. And uh, the things with COVID and all the other restrictions have kind of held us back a little bit about getting some traction on some of this. We also had a reorganization. That's why I'm an architect now. So our whole team's changed. We've gone to an agile methodology and uh, that has slowed a few things down as well, but we're, we're making a lot of progress. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So we're gonna replace these two tools. Ganglio is a tool that's built into Linux boxes that shows you some performance data. Um, the data that we're getting out of uh, Grafana right now, we have uh, I think 150 people using it out of Grafana already without really advertising it much. Um, we wanted a SaaS solution. Um, we felt like in some of our testing, uh, Influx was one of the fastest things we've seen. And then the extensions list and things that we can develop uh, were really important to us. This is how we host our tool. Um, we have uh, four Telegraph forwarders. We have over 8,000 servers. I believe we have over 10,000 installed now. Um, we do not have AIX yet, but we're working on that. There's no uh, AIX Telegraph, so we're actually creating our own. Uh, we have it working on uh, a couple boxes, so we just have to deploy it. Um, and then we send all that through these four forwarders, uh, which have pretty decent resource sizes, they're VMs, and then it goes off into the Influx Cloud. And we are hosted on uh, Influx Cloud. So we, we liked Influx because of all these uh, uh, 
different inputs and output plugins available. And uh, as, as Discover, we have a ton of these, uh, cap you know, ton of these companies in house. And first, we went with the Active Directory, Red Hat, Windows, you know, all the all the main ones. Um, we do have some Splunk data in there, even though. Uh, we don't have uh, the enterprise version of Grafana with the plugin, but we are able to query Splunk through the API and move it into uh, uh, Influx. Um, we have some Prometheus data coming in already and some uh, you know, Kubernetes information, but we're working on CloudWatch, uh, AIX, like I said earlier, and some of these other technologies to get some more of that data in. And we're using this tool very differently than some people that I've talked to. I mean, there's people that are doing th things in influx, like keeping track of their windmills um, or their video games. And I find it interesting that, uh, you know, a tool like this is so across the board for, for what people use it for. We brought this in as an infrastructure monitoring tool. Oops, I don't know what happened there. Apologize. some reason, oh. So let me start from here. It won't let me, huh. Well, I'm gonna do it from the screen here. Sorry about that. There's something wonky with the presentation, but enterprise server metrics, over a hundred metrics of the box. Uh, that what we collect. So when we roll an agent out to Linux or to Windows, uh, we actually have a bunch of base metrics that we have out there. We also give configuration options for people to add tags. Um, so right now we have over 10,000 Telegraph agents and uh, it's it's been pretty successful. Uh, Scalability has been great. So. Um, and so this is our MoogSoft integration. Um, they wanted me to kind of cover this because of how we uh, did. I think with the new uh, uh, webhook feature in 2.0, it'll be even easier, but we used the post command to post the MoogSoft uh, webhook. And uh, we haven't had many problems with that. So and you can see here in MoogSoft, this is all normalized in flux data here for file system. Um, and we're still working through some of the uh, details on that. All right, so chronograph. We use chronograph uh, just to basically watch our infrastructure. Um, we're gonna use Grafana for users. And that's just a, a, a fact of the, the, the reason that we want more than one uh, data point inside the, the graphing tool that we use, the dashboarding tool that we use. So the ESM team at Discover is gonna use chronograph to make sure that the, the, the cloud is healthy and to keep track of what they're adding in capacitor, things like that but we're not gonna use it necessarily for uh, uh, users to, to log into it. So right here, you can see our telegraph forwarder status and things like that. We have all of that in here to show us the health of our system. And you can see with 10,000 systems, this was just taken last week or a week before, I believe, um, pretty, pretty, pretty low uh, thresholds. And then our, uh, you know, our overall CPU and memory resource, very low. And then this is our basically our default rules that we put in. So all our enterprise rules are going to go in here um, from a, a management perspective. And then any kind of like individualized rules are probably going to be done in another process where we use the API. We want to automate that whole process of uh, rule creation. So, you know, ba based on a server that you get, you're going to get X amount of rules, you're going to get X amount of metrics and anything on top of that, there'll be ways to do that uh, through ServiceNow uh, engagement. And Grafana usage, this is something that was just a huge win for us right when we got in flux. So I, uh, I created this because of the, the COVID the pandemic. And uh, this is something the command center has been using from day one. Uh, day one, Discover did not have enough resources to have everybody working from home. They just didn't. So they had built up the uh, ASA environment for, from Cisco. And uh, this data right here comes straight off those devices. And you can see here people when they log in, when they log out. Um, so it kept track of that and the resources of all those devices. The bottom left stuff is actually from a product called NetScout. It's actually showing you some baselining and some percentages of uh, some breaches and some, some uh, retrans alarms from the network. 
And now in the top right there, you can actually click on that button and it'll go into a link screen that will show you some links straight to NetScout if you want to investigate all those. And then the bottom right is actually coming out of Splunk for our RSA failures and successes. So this is what they needed on the screen. This is what we created. I think we created this in, you know, I think I created this in less than a day and a half. Um, and it, it's uh, really been beneficial to them. It just shows you how easy it is to get data into uh, Influx data. And then we, we, we downloaded some of these community dashboards from Grafana. Um, a lot of them we manipulated ourselves to make them show the data that we uh, wanted. But right now people can go out here and see any of their Linux hosts, Windows hosts, and get quite a bit of data uh, out of the tool. We also put vCenter v in. Uh, we have three vCenters in there and we're getting this data in, which we really didn't have a lot of visibility into before. And uh, the, the vSphere plugin from uh, Telegraph has been quite uh, quite successful so far. We also came up with a, a you know, maturity model for uh, application areas when they come to us. We have multiple maturity models. We have one for application performance management, which includes you know, a space of like Java instrumentation and uh, um, synthetics from Catchpoint. And then we have one here for infrastructure and platforms. And we have another one for event management. And this is basically, we're gonna start rating people level one, two, or three on infrastructure monitoring. Uh, for each application that's critical in key core, basically customer facing applications. And then, you know, if they get a rating of a level one, tell them what they need to do to make it a level two and a level three. We have some applications that are actually doing level three type work by kicking off orchestration, auto healing their application, auto recycling uh, JVMs, things like that. It's just a, a good methodology for people to follow on how to get to a level three. And then there's, I got a tips and tricks screen. Um, basically the forward configuration is important. We had these really overburdened by not setting the batch size and the buffer limits and the jitter values. So just uh, play with that until you have a good match. It is different per box, like the vSphere Telegraph plugin, you definitely need to change that. Anything with a large amount of data like our active directory boxes, we had to actually play with this or we, we get buffer overruns. Um, don't duplicate your configurations. We had an issue with duplicate configurations at a time. Um, and then, uh, sorry, then choose metrics that matter. Um, there's so many metrics you can collect. Um, I would not tell you to collect all of them. We use a lot of filtering in those uh, metric values just to collect the metrics that we found valuable, which is which is many, many more than we collected in CAUM, but it's not necessarily uh, every single category, especially like the process data, which is really heavy. But we are collecting every single process and every single process data point for memory, uh, CPU, and that's something we couldn't do with uh, UIM. So I kind of flew through that <laughs> it's a little faster than I thought I was, but if anybody's got questions, please let me know. Yeah, so why don't we um, go back to the um, all those systems that you're collecting metrics from, uh, spend a little time there. So um, it looked like there's lots and lots. Yeah, you have a lot, that one or one of the previous one. You have a, um, a lot of systems that are collecting all kinds of different metrics for your infrastructure. Um, my first question is, um, do you need to have all those different systems? Um, are you trying to, um, is it even possible to scale that down or, you know, it, with a company your size? And I think when you and I talked previously, a lot of those you just acquire, right, from, from company acquisitions. Um, I don't know if it's, some of it's from acquiring other companies. Um, and then you'll, you'll find out too when you acquire a company and that some of their technology might be a little bit, uh, a little bit old and you have to still support it. Um, but you know, our, our, uh, our company is not necessarily a, a, a finance company by itself, right? It's a financial technology company. Discover values itself as a tech company. You know, our application, our freeze it line, you know, if you can freeze it, you know, it's, it's all about technology. We are a FinTech. And being a FinTech allows our developers, which makes it very challenging to us, our development group can go out pretty much and get anything they want. They can program in what they want. They, you know, and then it comes back to us to actually monitor that environment. So I don't think it's very controllable, but 
something like uh, Telegraph Agent and Influx allows us so much to, to get that data in and to, uh, you know, uh, have, it, have it so that it's uh, the same normalized data, time, time series data, it makes it very valuable. Um, so is there, um, is there a set of uh, metrics, company level metrics that you guys are um, also watching that help to inform the metrics that you need to collect in your infrastructure? I don't know, a number of business transactions or is there something that, you know, is driving revenue that you guys are really sensitive to? Well, business transactions are, are watched through our APM tool. Um, and we do do a pretty good job at anomaly detection and AI ops in that tool, App Dynamics. Um, one thing we haven't done very well in the past is we had hard coded uh, metrics in the infrastructure space. And something we're trying to do with MoogSoft is I, when, when, when I have a file system that fills up, right, and I have an App Dynamics application that's, ha that's struggling, right, or has some kind of performance issue, I would love in the future, we haven't done this yet, we're getting there to open up a ticket and maybe you have a network problem going on or a batch job that failed. It'd be great to open one ticket on that issue and that person can see everything that's happening in that application at once um, to get that, you know, that, that dynamic view. And something that we're, we're doing in a POC for Grafana Enterprise is showing like multiple tools end to end stack to stack on the same screen, you know. We have, we have Instana and OpenShift. We have AppDynamics and non-OpenShift. I can show those both on the screen with ServiceNow data and Influx data, all on the same screen with those metrics um, with the times being aligned. And it really helps a lot for the command center or others to see what's going on and get to root cause more quickly. Um, so it's speaking of, you know, seeing all those metrics, I see that you've got Kibana on this list as well, but um, what are you planning on using? What kind of, are, are you just going to be using the Elasticsearch logs Correct. in Kibana? Yeah, we're currently connecting uh, uh, Elasticsearch to uh, uh, Grafana and we might move some of that data in Influx to make it easier to, uh, to alert on, to query. Um, we're still working through a lot of that, but yeah, the elastic stack is very important to us. We have a lot of data in there, but nobody's really getting any alerts out of it. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it is a lot of data. It is. It's um, almost too much data. So maybe we take, you know, piece points, 10 minute sections out of it uh, and, and move that into uh, influx like I did with the Splunk data. Yeah, and it's and it's um, data that you feel reluctant to um, get rid of because you know in the event that you need it, you really really need it. Um, so we have you a do. question from Jose, and Jose asks, "Can you cast more light on how you do alerts?" Um, yeah, um, it, 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 I guess uh, you know our current alerting model is uh, UIM is actually sending alert to Netcool. And Netcool then opens up a ticket service now, uh, and there's not a lot of uh, uh, there's not a lot of AI ops involved in that process, right? We do some deduplication of events in Netcool, but Netcool is a pretty old product that hasn't really been touched by IBM very for very long. So there's not a lot of pattern matching or any kind of algorithms that are based inside that tool. Um, I think IBM is currently adding some. But uh, you know, Moogsoft allows us to do things. We've already seen about a 30, 40% reduction in tickets, just putting a few of our sources into Moogsoft because it combines things uh, based on rules that you set up and the algorithms that actually guess on root cause. Um, so that's where we're going with it. I would love to get more anomaly detection inside of Influx. And I think that uh, you know, 2.0 has some of those capabilities. Um, because if you can do anomaly detection at the base product and then do it at the event level, you're going to really reduce your tickets and increase MTTR. We have we have a problem by us is we cut way too many tickets. Um, you know, there's some certain times an application will cut 180 tickets in a night, and, and you know people are swimming through trying to find the significant ticket, and uh, that's what we're trying we're trying to like fix the noise um, from a, a influx. Uh, data perspective, we're using this post message and some uh, uh, rules and capacitor to send those base alerts through. 
and then uh, uh, moving on into the future because we had so many custom events. We're going to try to figure out a way to do that based on a script that we run, a uh, program that we run to go get that information so we can do that automatic for folks instead of having us having to do requests. Right now, a request, a process request in UIM takes us 15 to 30 minutes uh, for an engineer to do that, and that's just uh, not a useful uh, use of their time. So we want to we want to automate that all in uh, in flux. I don't know if I answered your question, but you can always ask a follow up. <laughs> um, so um, uh, speaking of uh, alerting, you actually attended the flux training that we had at the beginning of um, our influx days uh, North America experience. Um, what are your thoughts about that programming language? Do it, what takeaways do you have from uh, being exposed to flux? I really liked it. I mean, I know we're probably going to wait a while because of the enterprise version being a ways away, but I do feel like uh, it's moving in the right direction. It seems a lot better than TickScript. Um, and once you have it down, I, I, I think it's uh, pretty powerful. Well, the good thing is um, Flux is actually in the enterprise uh, version. So um, yeah, we, can, right. we can thank the product and engineering team for or making sure that happened. Um, so uh, I also want to talk a little bit about that COVID dashboard that you pulled together. Um, you know, I think I thought it was pretty interesting because a lot of people when, you know, you talk about, you know, doing work at home, it's usually just a, a, a big cultural um, kind of a shift for a company and a cultural challenge. Um, and I wonder, I mean, did your own management team even understand um, how resource intensive it would be and how much work it would be actually for you and your team to, to allow all these people to work from home. Did showing them this dashboard shed that kind of light on what you guys are doing? They didn't. And uh, I think, you know, we had a text dashboard that was watching these a little bit, but it wasn't as intense as this. And one of the things about this dashboard is it really right off the bat, we saw one device that was taking up way too much CPU more than all the other devices. So I think the first day we saw a difference in one of them. And you can see here on this one currently, they all look like they're in line. Uh, it's not an active dashboard, obviously, but they're all in line, right? Um, and, uh, you know, in the past, we had one that was always taking more CPU or more memory. And then they did expand these. We only had like four. So, I mean, we had probably the... Uh, throughput to handle half the company working from home, but not like the whole company. So they did, we did work in about a month and a half of expanding it. We had issues here and there, probably every three or four days, something broke, but I think that was pretty common across the internet. I think if you remember when COVID first hit Zoom meetings, you couldn't talk, uh, WebExes were slow, um, always getting disconnected. So I think, I think it took a while for people to ramp up the spend that they needed to, to allow that many people to work from home. Yeah, I think we all now are very sympathetic to each other when it comes to Zoom or WebEx disasters. You know, kids running around in the background, <laughs> video cutting out, all that stuff. We're now now it's just you know part of uh, our day to day. Um, uh, let's see, we do have a question from the audience, and Joel asks, um, "Are you creating alt text scripts using the UI? I found it easier to use templates, tasks, and importing them using the CLI to manage them that way." Yeah, you know, I think uh, I just found out about that method, and I think we're going to be investigating. Right now, we're using the GUI, so that is a very good point. Yeah, he also knows that um, uh, when using the UI, um, the uh, IDs are auto-generated. That makes the commands like the capacitor list task return a task list, so, um, so that is uh, something to uh, consider. Um, so, so right now, we're using the GUI to do it, and then we go in and we modify it quite quite a quite amount so oh, okay um, so we do modify it but um can you can we take a little bit of a look at that um one slide where you showed level one level two level three and um mm -hmm. and uh, maybe we can um make the powerpoint a little bit bigger for everybody so you mentioned that level three is uh, where you want to get to so that's kind of in that kind of self-healing there we go perfect so maybe you can just um, just just talk a little bit about uh, the ex well. First of all, you know I think did you map this out before, um, and then you know kind of came up with you know steps to get through level one, to get through level two, and then eventually to level three. We do have some steps, but a lot of it is uh, you know you have to work with our team and think and and items like that, right? Right right out of the box, we give you level one. 
you're going to have your things monitored. You're going to have your CPU disk processes monitored, right? Um, then now we need the areas help to help us moving past level one, okay? Um, they do get some level two stuff right out of the box, like an in integration with the event manager, MOOCsoft, right? They get the metrics, the events, the logs, the traces, and the real-time visualization. But if they don't do anything with it, it's just out there as a, you know, as a server somewhere. So it's them getting their own dashboards, their, their ability to see their information. I think the, the hardest part of all this is getting to level three. Understanding that we can, through influx, uh, and this is our plan moving forward, we're going to cut a ticket and that ticket's going to kick off ServiceNow orchestration, which will fly back to the box to fix something automatically. We're already doing that with a few things like we'll run some file system clear scripts uh, through orchestration to clear them. And if it comes back cleared, we'll close a ticket automatically before people get it. We want less people working tickets for things that are non-essential. We really want to know when like the application's degraded. Um, you know, a lot of times people will get a CPU alert or, or a memory alert on a server. Uh, it's 90%, but what does that really tell you? It doesn't really tell you much at all, right? Is the application effect that is what's really the importance, right? And moving forward with OpenShift and, and serverless monitor, serverless environments, and people don't really, I don't think really, we have a huge pivotal environment. I don't know if people really care where their application is running actually. Um, they just want to know when their application performance is impacted. And I think from an influx perspective and server monitoring, I think it's changed a lot. I feel like it's a secondary thing to tell you what's going on. I don't know if it's an initial seed event. Um, I think that, you know, CPU, memory, all those things are great to know if you know you're having an application issue, but if you're not, it doesn't really tell you all that much. And I don't know if I answered your question, but I'd love to get to the point where we can do some preventative and self-healing through orchestration. So um, your audience um, for the services that you guys provide, are they developers? Are they, um, are they just operators of applications? Maybe you can describe um, what they're trying to accomplish and what are they trying to um, you know, get from the service that you guys are providing? Do they want you to do the troubleshooting or they just want to have enough, um, get enough data or get enough insights into what they might be able to do to fix things? Yeah, it depends on the group. Sometimes we work straight with the developers. Quite often we don't. They have like a level one operational support. Um, working with the developers is great, but you know, you, we have to, uh, as a company, we have to get uh, developers more on, on goal to develop their tool with, with uh, observability in mind from the beginning. And uh, right now I'm working with another uh, domain architect from the application side, and we are planning to have a, a more of a capabilities maturity model for that process to make sure that when we start designing new applications, which Discover does all the time, uh, uh, to make sure that they have this mindset, like we, should, we need to make sure the metrics are out there. We need to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna be uh, able to observe this application from end to end. Uh, when we go live. And a, a lot of times that has not happened in the past. So, you know, getting the word out there that it's important, getting up our management to believe in that and to push it, which they are, is, is, is uh, really something I see that's been happening uh, recently. I know we, we talked about this before, but um, you, I know you guys are monitoring the infrastructure, but any plans to allow your um, developers from other teams to put in their custom metrics into your InfluxDB instance? Yeah, we are. Yeah, good question. We already started that. We have, uh, we have actually started this past week allowing people to uh, uh, do that. I work with a couple different teams. One of them is uh, uh, an OpenShift team. They get uh, infrastructure events out of OpenShift and they're going to move that stuff in manually. Not manually, but with curl commands, they're going to automate it. And they already started uh, putting some, some uh, items into their own database and in influx. And so we have a lot of departments that so were using open source influx locally. I think the chef team's doing that and some other teams, and we're going to try to uh, expand that so they can use the cloud version. Yeah, we hear that uh, quite a bit. Uh, I mean, that's that's probably because of the um, open source nature that it's just really easy to you know download it and start to put in your metrics um, into the into the database. Um, are there any, um, I mean, you guys just started doing that, but what, has there been any, any learnings from that? so far? Not really, but I mean, even the even that COVID dashboard is something I did that with, right? It wasn't a typical, uh, 
you know, it's actually a Perl script that puts the data into influx from, uh, you know, SNMP devices. So if you can do that, you can pretty much move data from one place to another for almost anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. yeah, definitely. Uh, SNMP is still quite useful. Um, okay, so Joel has a follow-up question for you. He's wondering if you're using continuous queries to do uh, roll-ups or, or downsample any of your data over time. Yeah, we're, we're actually, uh, like I said, we're not active yet with our alerting. <laughs> I saw a Pearl hacker comment, but yeah, we're not, we're not actually uh, sending the alerts yet. And we're having a problem with how many, uh, uh, how much utilization is actually in capacitor. So uh, to, to your point, we're actually trying to sample 10 minutes um, and do a mean on that. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's a, a 10 minute query. Yeah, I think he's um, asking, he wants to know, he's a follow-up question. Um, you know, how are your resources responding to that downsampling uh, task? The resources in the cloud? They're, they're, they're your, disk, your disk utilization. So he just wanted to know uh, how, how that was going. It looks fine for us when we're testing. Um, yeah. So um, how did you actually find out about InfluxDB? Well, one of our engineers who uh, uh, works in Influx, John Chalos, he actually... Uh, he actually uh, found it on a website. I had heard it before, but I thought it was just a database. So we started investigating and I saw Telegraph. I played around with the open source a little bit and then we brought it on for the POC. So we had, we had a lot of POC products. I mean, I had some listed there, but we had probably about 12 that we looked at and we had just done a POC three years earlier, right? When we selected UIM. So uh, we had a pretty good idea what was in the market. Very good. Um, so, uh, so how long have you been playing with um, InfluxDB now? So we really signed at the end of December last year, and we started going really in April. And it took us a long time to get the agents out on the servers. That was our number one goal. So right now we're probably missing a couple hundred servers only, but we have over 10,000 uh, out there. So it's a lot of servers sending metrics, and now we're going to... Uh, uh, before the end of the year, we're going to start doing those base alerts out of UIM and replace all of those, get those going through Moogsoft. We're, we're getting close. Um, you know, we have, there's a lot of other things we had to design with this. We had an, uh, an old maintenance mode process that we had to, we have to address. Um, there, there's just a lot of tech debt that we had uh, that makes it very difficult to move some of the stuff. So it's not necessarily an issue with Influx, but it's more of a tech debt uh, and you know, 15, 20 years of processes and, and uh, Netcool and some of the other processes that we have. Um, so 10,000 agents is a lot. Um, any uh, challenges that you had with getting all those telegraph agents out, keeping them, you know, being able to you know, send information to InfluxDB, anything that if you were to do it again that you might do differently that um, you know, might, might provide as um, some insight to a best practice for our audience? Yeah, I don't, I think we, we rolled out the Linux ones with Chef. Um, we have a chef, chef Cookbook and it works really well. The only problem with that is Chef is not running on all our servers all the time because of other issues with Chef. Um, but and we'd use SCCM for a uh, uh, Windows platform to roll it out and package it. I would just say, make sure that you have the right uh, uh, buffer settings. Um, depending on how many metrics you're collecting, because it can get buffer overruns. And I've noticed that Telegraph on Linux and Windows, when you have buffer overruns, it just stops. It just exits. Um, and I, and uh, you know, I, even in testing uh, 116, it seems to do that. But once you have the buffer settings right, I mean, I've had, I've had uh, uh, at least uh, 50 of our boxes running, and I don't know of any that really went down in the last eight months. So it's pretty... Pretty, uh, pretty good tool if you have it configured properly, uh, the Telegraph agent. Yeah, that's that's usually what we hear from uh, our community. And I would actually recommend taking an, another look at the list. As um, Ryan mentioned, you know, over 50 new plugins were just released in the last year. Um, I was just taking a, a look at the list the other day and I feel like I'm surprised all the time at um, the great community yep. contributions. And uh, there's definitely gonna be uh, more to come. Um, let's see, Fabio yeah, has a question. Oops, sorry. Just real quick, Windows event log was a big thing for us. So I've been, I'm testing that right now. It just came out in 116. So. Good. We'd love to get your contributions on that. And I'm sure there's plenty of other people that um, would mm -hmm. love to take a look at that. 
Um, okay, so Fabio has a question for you. And Fabio asks, are your business transaction writing in real-time metrics influx or another time series database? And how do you face the uh, peak of transactions? And I think you said you were, let me think. Our business transactions aren't writing to influx. They're actually in app dynamics. That's right. So, and they are real time. So, you know, we have, we have a different tool set for different things. Um, we didn't get influx for application performance, um, but it definitely can help with that. Um, the business transaction details inside of AppD are pretty, uh, pretty deep. Um, so uh, I know you guys have only used InfluxDB for a short period of time. Um, and uh, we always appreciate when developers say, hey, yeah, it was easy to get up and running. But maybe one bit of advice that you might give somebody that is you know, attempting to tackle grabbing metrics from as many systems as um, what you guys have done. Yeah, I think that uh, understanding how time series databases work is a little bit, I'm still learning. It's been quite a few months and I'm still learning. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no way to delete a column, right? Or to delete a, a old data. So, you know, you, you just gotta be, uh, I, I would suggest getting it exactly the way you want it, the data into the database. And then uh, as you do your cleanup, you know, delete it once, rebuild it, and then go from there. Um, we had some issues where we were uh, turning on a few things on a few boxes, testing stuff. And then all of a sudden we've got, you know, 500 extra columns in the database that you know you can't get rid of. Yeah, it's it's ironic, isn't it? It's schemaless, but then you really should think about the schema. <laughs> you should, right? <laughs> so you don't get that makes yourself. it that makes it that makes it that makes it good, right? It's fast to get it up and running. I mean, I worked with the team two weeks ago. We got a database for them up and running and data going into it in a matter of an hour, hour and a half. So the the, the speed you if you understand the product and understand how it works, the speed to get you know, worth out of it, it's pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, no, we hear that uh, quite a bit. Um, so in the talks that you heard earlier, especially with Ryan's talks, any plans to um, incorporate or start to look at some of the um, features that he mentioned? Yeah, I think we will. I think there was some stuff that, uh, you know, he was talking about from 2.0 that looks really intriguing. So we'll, we'll see when we, uh, you know, first things first, we got to get all the alerting turned on and uh, ex escort UIM out of the premises. <laughs> um, and then we're definitely going to look at some of those more advanced features. I think the class I was in for uh, flux language, uh, how you could just do queries for anomalies and, and types of things like that that are pretty advanced. I think those are the things that we really, uh, really want to look at in the future. Cool. So in fact, I would um, recommend that not only you look into Flux a little bit deeper, but um, I would take a, a look at the uh, templates um, that come with uh, 2.0. And the good thing is there is actually a vSphere template. Uh, so you can take a look at that and see if that you know is going to um, be able to uh, serve your needs. It was um, actually created by one of our Influx Aces, Ignacio, who actually got inspiration from another Influx Ace, uh, Jorge. And uh, Jorge, um, who's actually on our, our panelists right now, also has done a webinar talking about um, how he um, uses the, um, the vSphere Telegraph plugin and, and um, a set of Grafana dashboards that he's created. So you might have been, you might have grabbed those dashboards um, that uh, Jorge actually created. So probably did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> did. So we can do the introductions. So I'm sure Jorge would love to get any feedback on uh, making some improvements or, or or some changes to that. Yeah, if you have big vSphere's, um, some of those dashboards definitely have to be tweaked if you have a large vSphere environment. So we did have to tweak those quite a bit. But we are we are gonna we are talking about next year adding a layer into with Kafka. I saw somebody had put that down. Uh, uh, to get uh, Kafka in the middle. So, you know, we have guaranteed delivery of the metrics. So that is something that we're definitely looking at. Yeah, it's definitely a very popular um, addition to a lot of our enterprise architectures to, to throw Kafka in it. And it's so easy to do that. Um, and, you know, we're always happy to, to um, share other use cases so you can see different models or you can talk to any of our sales engineers and they have a lot of experience with that as well. Um, any um, other thoughts that you want to share about how you guys are using InfluxDB in your environment? 
No, I think I covered everything. Awesome. So um, I know you're going to hang out in the Slack channel for a little bit. Uh, so if anybody has any questions and, you know, sometimes these questions uh, pop up into our minds after the speaker has left, uh, don't worry, our speaker's still here. He's just not in full presentation mode. He'll be in the Slack channel or on the Zoom chat. And um, we're always happy to connect anybody together because um, this is what it's all about, is bringing different community members together. All right, so with that, um, we will end this session. Thank you so much, Kurt. Thank you.